Now let me, we could spend a lot of time wading through scholastic arguments about the text. I'm going to give you, I'm going to show you a shortcut. I'm going to show you a shortcut. There are, in the Scripture, there are authentication codes. There's an automatic security monitor watching over every single letter of the text that doesn't rust or wear out and it's been running continually for several thousand years and most people don't know about it. There is a fingerprint, what I call a fingerprint signature of the author in the Scripture and uh, we'll show you that. And furthermore, this authentication code is of a non-compromisable design. Now if you're an engineer your mouth is watering. Boy, where is this thing? I want to see this thing. Let me back up a little bit now and give you some background. How many of you have noticed there are sevens in the Bible? Anybody without their hand up hasn't read their Bible. Right? You know, over 600 passages have it very explicitly so. Some of these are very overt. It's very obvious. Seven of this and seven of that or whatever. Some of them are structural. Someone will list a few things. You'll always notice there's always seven of them. You find those. They're subtle. Some are not only subtle, some are actually hidden. And yet you can find them if you know how to look. The, I'm going to suggest to you the possibility that these heptatic structures are a signature of the Creator Himself. And let's take a look at some examples. I want you to imagine, you don't have to actually do this, but I want you to imagine yourself seriously taking this on an assignment. Imagine yourself taking on a scratch pad, blank piece of paper, and I want you to design a family tree, a genealogy. And by the way, for this assignment, you can do this from fiction. You can make it up as you go. How many could do that? Obviously you could. Okay, that's, that's, no, that's no problem. You know, fathers and sons, make up a family tree. Okay. Except I got a couple of rules I want you to follow. When, when you finished your assignment, you turn it in. I want the number of words that you used to be an exact multiple of seven. In other words, if I take the total number of words that in, is in your uh, d d uh, work product, if I divide it by seven, I don't have any remainder. So it's either seven words, 14, 21, 28. In other words, whatever number of words you use, it's an exact multiple of seven. How many could do that? You could fudge it around to multiple of seven, right? Good, yeah, sure you could. Of course you could. I've got another rule I want to add. I want the number of letters that you use to also be an exact multiple of seven. I can sense that some of you have dropped out. You say that, that you begin to realize that's a little tricky. And it's anything I'm talking about in English here, aren't I? In English, you can fudge around sometimes. You can, poets always do that. You throw an asterisk in or something. Okay. There's an, I want the number of vowels and the number of consonants to be divisible by seven exactly. If I go through all your words, I count the vowels, it's an exact multiple of seven. You got a problem with that? Of course you do. You realize that to make it a multiple of seven, if it's a random result, you've got six chances of losing and only one of winning. It hasn't come out right. You with me? So every time I add a rule, it makes it tougher. I'm going to say I want the number of words that begin with a vowel to be divisible by seven. Well, that's kind of a chicken. And obviously if that's the number of words that begin with a consonant must be divisible by seven. The number of words that occur more than once to be divisible by seven. Do you, anybody still playing? You get the feeling that this would be hard to do, right? Those that occur in more than one form divisible by seven. Those that occur in only one form to be divisible by seven. The number of nouns shall be divisible by seven. The number only seven words shall not be nouns. That's easy, probably, maybe not. The number of names shall be divisible by seven. Only seven other kinds of nouns shall be permitted beside names. The number of male names shall be divisible by seven, and the number of generations shall be divisible by seven. You probably guessed where I'm headed here. Because this is a description of the genealogy of Jesus Christ in the first 18 verses of the book of Matthew. And, in, and incidentally, we're talking about the Greek, not the Hebrew or English. In English, it's soft. You can fudge around. Greek is incredibly precise. Every verb has to meet five conditions and so forth. It's a tight, precise language. And what I'm sharing with you here, of course, is the discoveries of Dr. Ivan Penin. He's a very interesting guy, born in Russia in 1855. He was exiled in an early age. He got tangled up in a plot against the Tsar. He eventually emigrated to Germany and then finally to the United States. He graduated from Harvard in 1882 with a PhD in mathematics. But then he discovered Jesus Christ. Now, by the way, 
every one of us in this room that has, has discovered Jesus Christ, whether you know it or not, is a result of a miracle wrought by someone's prayer. For some of you, the stories are really quite dramatic. For many of us, it's quite routine. But every one of us that accept Christ are a result of a miracle. But if you're a Ph.D. from Harvard, that's a miracle indeed. Okay? So. But shortly after becoming a Christian, he discovered this ha- these haptatic structures, these sevenfold structures that underlie the biblical text. He discovered that about 1890. He committed the rest of his life, more than 50 years, generating over 43,000 pages, writing incidentally in very small letters. He's got a very tight hand uh, of discoveries. He went to his Lord on October 30th of 1942 and left behind all kinds of, of uh, discoveries. Candidly, it's very tedious to go through because it's laborious stuff, and yet what comes out of this are some treasures, and I'll show you a few highlights. That was the one that I showed you. The, the genealogy of Jesus Christ fits all those conditions. And even if you try to simulate that, you'll discover it's almost impossible to get something to fit all those conditions. But let's talk about a specific practical example. If you look at your Bible at the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark, you will probably find a footnote in it. Something to the effect that these verses are in dispute and were probably added later by some copyist. That's the typical kind of remark you see, annotating the last 12 verses of the Gospel of Mark. And uh, the question is, uh, were they added later? Or, or, you know, Westcott and Hort um, regards the last part of Mark, that's verses uh, 9 through 20 of chapter 16, as a later addition, that this wasn't in the original, it was added by well, some well-intended copyist down the road a bit. Well, that's easily shredded because Irenaeus in 150 A.D. quotes it in his commentary. The, 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 the uh, Alexandrian codices were 4th century. But in the 1st and 2nd century we have quotes from uh, these so-called verses that were added later. No, they weren't added later. They were expurgated from the Alexandrian codices, is my contention. So Irenaeus either had a copy of the original, or he must have been clairvoyant. I don't think he was going to be clairvoyant. Hippolytus, in the, also in the second century, quotes from these twelve verses. And these are several hundred years before the Alexandrian codices. So if these verses are not in the Alexandrian codices, they were expurgated. So you can attack this scholarship from the point of view of historical records, but I'm going to show you something even more surprising. If we studied the last twelve verses of Mark, we discover that verses 9 to 11 are an appearance to Mary, and, and, and just discusses the, t- the disciples' initial disbelief. From verse 11 to 18 are subsequent appearances, and then the conclusion of the chapter is verses 19 to 20. So from 9 to 20 is what we're talking about. Another way to, to organize those uh, 12 verses is from verses 9 to 14 a simple narrative. Verses 15 to 18 is a discourse by Jesus Christ, and the last two verses are a conclusion of the whole gospel. And by the way, if you take these 12 verses away, you leave the Gospels with the people confused and in disarray and in disbelief. You have no resurrection. So you can see why the Gnostics would love to drop those verses off. But anyway, these are the verses that are there. Let me share some things with you that Pannon discovered about these verses. The number of words in these 12 verses are 175. That's a multiple of seven exactly. Oh, really? The vocabulary involved is 98 different words. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The number of letters in the 12 verses are 553. That's a multiple of seven exactly. The vowels are a multiple of seven exactly. The consonants, obviously, would be a multiple of seven exactly. The total vocabulary, I said, was 98 words. 84 of those are found earlier in the book of Mark. That's a multiple of seven exactly. Fourteen of these words are found only here. It's a multiple of seven exactly. Forty-two of those words are used in the Lord's address. Fifty-six are not part of his, uh, were not part of his vocabulary that are in, the, in, this, in these twelve verses. All multiples of seven exactly. Now, I've, if I take just two, two rules, if I have one rule, you've got six chances of losing, one of winning, right? To meet two rules, it's seven squared. In other words, I have forty eight chances of losing, and only one of having both rules of seven. You follow me? It goes by the square, right? Two rules, it's the square. For three rules, it's the cube of that. 
340, I'd have 343 chances of losing for every one of winning. And so it goes. Where four rules is 2401. I've given you so far nine rules. So the ch- the, 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 you have one chance, if, if this is a random process, you have one chance in 40 million of coming out okay. You see, how, see it, it, the more rules you add, the more restrictive it becomes. Would you like to try this, by the way? Now, if, so, assume you worked eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, for 50 weeks a year. That means you've got about 2,000 uh, productive hours per year. And put those in minutes, that's 120,000 minutes per year. You've got seven to nine chances to try this randomly. 40 million attempts. Let's assume it takes you 10 minutes to do a draft. And if it doesn't work, it takes another 10 minutes to try another draft. Well, then in that case, it would take you about 3,362 years to come up with that design. And, uh, but by the way, it gets worse. Um, I said there were 175 words, 56 in the address of the Lord, uh, 119 in the rest of the passage. In the, in the introductory verses, it was 35. Each one of these is multiple of seven exactly. In other words, uh, in the various groupings of the, uh, uh, the natural divisions of the passage, you'll find it's always a multiple of seven exactly. And uh, it goes on and on. I won't badger this more than you need to here. There's something else you need to know about both Hebrew and Greek. They're distinctive in that each letter has a numerical value, and it, it is relevant that way. In, here's a list of the Greek words. The, uh, the alpha is worth one, the beta two, gamma three, and so forth, right on through uh, to the end. And uh, this is this, the use of numerical values of letters is called gametria. There's a geometrical value. Every word thus has a numerical value. The numerical or geometrical value of this the total geometrical value of the passage happens to be 106,663, which is a multiple of seven exactly. Try doing that by accident. And if you take each one of these natural groupings, you'll discover each one has a geometrical value of a multiple of seven exactly. The first word, the middle word, the last word, and so forth. And it goes on and on, uh, as you can imagine here. Um, I said we have a vocabulary of 98 words, 14 not before in Mark, 7 found later in the New Testament. Uh, 35 occurrences, um, and uh, the uh, numerical value of them, again, is a multiple of seven exactly. Uh, the, uh, the verse 20 of vocabulary is 14. Uh, it, it goes on and on uh, in terms of words found here previously, words not found. Everything's a multiple of seven exactly. The total forms is 133. The value of those are 89,663, which is a multiple of seven exactly. Those that occur more than once is 112, which is a multiple of seven. Occurring more than once is 21, a multiple of seven. Occurring 63 times, which itself is a multiple of seven. And we could go on and on like this. There is a word here that's an unusual word because it occurs nowhere else in the New Testament. It has a numerical value of 581, which is a multiple of seven exactly. And it's preceded by 42 vocabulary words and in, in, in the passage by 126. All these are multiples of seven exactly. Now I've gone, I've added a lot on here. We started out with just nine rules. I've just given you 34 of them. What's the chance of these rules having happened by just random chance? Well, let's take a look at that. That's uh, 7 to the 34th power, which is roughly 5 times 10 to the 28th tries would be needed. Now, you've already had enough experience with, large, with powers of 10 to realize these are big numbers. Let's assume you'd like to try to simulate this, and I'll let you have a computer to help you, okay? There are about 3 times 10 to the 7th seconds per year. And I'm going to give you a computer that can do 400 million tries per second. Okay? That's a pretty, that's a pretty good machine. And uh, that means it would take about 4 times 10 to the 8th tries per second. It would take about 4.3 mi- m- uh, million million computer years. Or put it another way, I would need one million uh, supercomputers working 4.3 million years to obtain this result by randomness. By randomness. So this is, this is again, and by the way, I've just used 34, 34 conditions here. Pannon identified 75 of them. So you can say some of those are, in, are not independent of each other. That's true. So two or three of those actually derive one from the other. Okay, throw those out. I've got 75 to pick from. 
The New Testament, let me show you some other things that Tannen, Pannon discovered. The New Testament consists of 27 books, right? That means there's an opening and closing word to each of the 27 books. It begins and ends with a word, right? So 2 times 27, that means there's 54 words, right? Among those 54 words is a total vocabulary of 28 words that are a multiple of 7 exactly. In the Gospels alone, there's a multiple of 7 exactly. The total geometrical value of those words is also a multiple of 7 exactly. The value of the shortest word, which is one letter, is 70, and it's a multiple of 7, obviously. The value of the longest word is a multiple of 7, and this one's particularly interesting. The longest word happens to be apocalypsis, and it happens to be 7 times 6 times 6 times 6. That's kind of interesting, I think. There's, this is the one I love. I, I, I realize we're hitting a lot, a lot of these things. It, it, it uh, may be overkill here. But I want to show you the one that blows me away completely. We've discovered the vocabulary in the Greek that's unique to Matthew. Uh, now understand what I'm talking about. The vocabulary that's unique. These are words that only Matthew uses. If you go through the whole Bible, take all the words, there are 42, uh, there, there's a vocabulary that's unique to Matthew. It occurs only 42 times. It's a multiple of seven exactly. And those have 126 letters. A multiple of seven exactly. Now what makes this particularly uh, peculiar is let's assume for discussion that Matthew tried to do this on purpose. How would you do that? If you were Matthew and you decided you would like to have this characteristic in your gospel, how would you go about making sure that the words that you alone use is a multiple of seven exactly. Well, you've got to, you can only do it two ways. You've got to sit down with all the other writers of the New Testament, figuring out, assuming you can figure out who they're going to be, and get them to agree not to use your little list of words. How many think that happened? Not very likely. Or you could argue that this feature is an argument that Matthew wrote last. Because in theory, at least, he could lay down everybody else's writings and make sure that it fit. So you could use this as an argument that Matthew wrote his gospel last. He either had prior agreement, that doesn't make sense, or his gospel was written last. Okay, the gospel of Matthew has a vocabulary unique to itself that's a multiple of seven exactly. Which, but that, so does Mark. Well, I thought Matthew wrote last. No, Mark wrote last, because Mark also has a vocabulary unique to him that's a multiple of seven exactly. But so does Luke. And so does John. They each were written last. And obviously I'm being facetious. And so did James, Peter, Jude, and Paul. Each one was written last. In other words, each one has a vocabulary that nobody else uses that happens to be an exact multiple of seven. There's only one explanation for this that, uh, that I can tolerate mathematically, and that is that the Holy Spirit was an overseer of every word, every letter in the New Testament. I think that's exciting. By the way, this even bridges the Old New Testaments. You know, I often joke that I'm going to have a, t I'm going to have a conference and have an advertised conference. We're going to tear out the page of the Bible tonight that's unnecessary. That'll smoke out all the fundamentalists, right? And then we'll very ceremoniously open the Bible and tear out the page between the Old and New Testament because it's unnecessary. There are words that have this heptatic feature if and only if you put the Old and New Testament together. The word hallelujah occurs 24 times in the Old Testament, four times in the New. 4 plus 24 is 28, a multiple of 7 exactly. Hosanna, Shepherd, Jehovah Sabaoth. And I go through a list of these words that are not multiples of 7 in either Old and New Testament, but they are a multiple of 7 when you put the Old and New Testament together. I think that's kind of fun. All this, of course, is detailed in our a briefing package called How We Got Our Bible. But the main point is these specifications that we talked about have been fulfilled. The specifications in the Bible says that he would be born of a virgin, and he was. That he would be born in Bethlehem, and he was. That he would be taken into Egypt, and he was. That he would heal the sick and make people whole, and he did. And each one of these is documented. You can look up the verses. He would be crucified, and he was. That he would die for our sins, and he did. That he would be raised from the dead, and he was. And uh, so... Why do we accept the Bible? Because these little numbers from canon? No, 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 that's not the reason. We do this because it's the authentication of Jesus Christ. The Septuagint has over 300 detailed specifications he's fulfilled in his lifetimes. The 70 weeks prophecy that we studied in Daniel chapter 9 is undeniable. So we have the authentication of who Christ is, first of all. The Scripture authenticates who Christ was. Then we can lean on the authentication by Christ 
of the Torah, of Daniel, in fact of the whole Old Testament. It's an integrated design. That's our apologetic. That's the one that's bulletproof. That this, these 66 books penned by over 40 different guys over virtually 2,000 years is an integrated package and that it transcends the dimensionality of time itself. No other book on the planet Earth does that. 66 separate books but penned by 40 different guys who didn't even know each other over several thousand years. Their design anticipates in detail events before they happen. So they obviously the source of this message is from outside our physical universe, outside our time domain. There are all kinds of hidden authentication codes in the Scripture. We've talked about some of the micro codes, these little numbers and so forth. There are also macro codes. We went through Genesis chapter 5 and the fact that we have the, the uh, summary of the Christian gospel tucked away in the genealogy in the Torah of all places. We have the macro codes. We looked at those in Genesis 5, Genesis 22, the Akita, the book of Ruth, the whole book of Joshua, and of course the transcendent numerical design that we've touched on here, just as we go along the way. But there is something else. How can you personally say, Chuck, I don't, I'm not a mathematician. I don't want to get into all that stuff. But how can I know? How can you know? And Jesus answers that for you in John 7, verse 17. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. That's Christ's challenge to you. Try him and see for yourself. One integrated design. The New Testament is in the Old Testament concealed. The Old Testament is in the New Testament revealed. And once you begin to discover that, once you begin to discover the integrity of the package, it'll change your whole perspective on everything that it says when you know you can rely on it. And uh, so we, we've, uh, we're going to now enter, in the next session, we'll actually enter the New Testament. We'll talk about the, uh, the obviously we'll enter the historical books, the Gospels, and uh, the interpretive letters will come separately, and Revelation. Along the way, we'll do some summaries. We'll have a whole eschatological summary or, of where end time prophecy is headed and so forth. Much of that will be controversial. Different good scholars have different views on some of these things. But in the New Testament, we have the five historical books. And next time we'll focus on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we're going to take a little different approach. With a limited uh, opportunity we have, we're not going to go through each book individually. We'll, go at, we'll talk about its distinctives first, but then we'll go through an integration of all of them geographically. Here's where he went, there's what he did, and we'll put it all together for you geographically when we do that. And uh, one of the things that uh, you'll learn that's kind of fun is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all have a different agenda. Matthew's a Jew. He presents Jesus Christ as the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Messiah, the promised Messiah. He's Jewish, very Jewish. Mark is really writing for Peter, but his emphasis is to present Jesus Christ as the suffering servant, the obedient to the Father. Luke's a different kind of guy altogether. Luke's a doctor. He's interested in presenting Jesus Christ as the Son of Man. The fact that God became man is what blew him away. And John is the, uh, takes the flip side of that, that he's the Son of God. Each one of these has a distinctive mission as he writes his gospel, and you'll discover something interesting. <coughs> Everything in their respective gospels supports that particular emphasis. Um, the genealogy. Matthew, being a Jew, starts his genealogy from Abraham and takes it through the legal line, through Joseph the legal father of Jesus Christ. Mark is a servant not interested in pedigree. He's the only one without a, without a, a, a genealogy. Luke, because he's interested in the Son of Man, he obviously starts with Adam. And we, from Adam to Abraham, when he gets to Abraham to David, they're both the same, Matthew and, and Luke. But when you get to David, Luke takes a left turn. He doesn't go through the first surviving son of Bathsheba as, as Matthew does. He goes through the second surviving son, down through a line that ends up with Mary. And uh, so he has the, so the bloodline. And that, there's a whole thing we'll get into when we get there. That, there's some fascinating mysteries behind all that. And John has a genealogy, but most people wouldn't recognize it. The first few verses is the genealogy of the pre-existent one. And uh, you can take a look at that and see what he says there. So Matthew emphasized what Jesus said, Mark what Jesus did, Luke what Jesus felt, he's the humanist of the bunch, and uh, John who he was. That's his emphasis. So Matthew writes to the Jew, Mark to the Roman, Luke to the Greek, John to the church. The first miracle 
And Matthew would first would be a leper cleanse. That's a very Jewish emphasis. Leprosy was a symbol of sin. Mark and Luke, both being Gentile or, or oriented, uh, demons expelled. John was the mystic. Water turned to wine is his first miracle in each one. It, the, the, uh, Matthew ends with the resurrection as any Jew would. Mark with the ascension. Luke with the promise of the Spirit setting up his sequel, which is Acts, the, Acts of the Holy Spirit. And then John, of course, the promise of his return for the church, of course. And John finishes that, sets himself up for revelation, if you will. And so it's interesting uh, when we study the camps and numbers, the east, west, south, uh, uh, and north had symbols. The ensign for Judah was the lion, right? And the uh, lion of the tribe of Judah. Mark was the, uh, uh, the, uh, the west, the next one was the Ephraim, the, uh, the, the ox, if you will. And uh, uh, Luke, the man, the Reuben was a symbol, it was a man, and Dan, uh, the eagle. So we have the face of the lion, the ox, the man, the eagle that those tri- those, that camp represented, the same as the face of the, ser- uh, ser- uh, the seraphim and the cherubim at, around the throne of God, fits the four Gospels. And you begin to realize there is a mystical overseer on how these things are designed. And uh, so that's kind of, I think, kind of fun. And there's also different styles in terms of groupings and snapshots and so forth. We'll talk about all that next time. So that's what we're about. And let's stand for a closing word of prayer. Fun time coming. We'll be going through a overview of the life of Christ where we'll put that all together up to the final week. We'll s- save a whole session for the final week because there's much, there's, a, there's an awful lot of there that Mel Gibson didn't tell you or couldn't tell you. We'll talk about that. And uh, I believe he did us a wonderful favor with this marvelous piece of work because he's given us the opportunity to open a conversation with anybody. But there are some things that he wasn't in a position to be able to communicate that we will extract from the text as we go forward. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we thank you for who you are. We pray, Father, that you would take these seeds that are planted in our lives. We pray, Father, that you'd nurse them to fruition. We pray, Father, that you'd illuminate that path before us that we each might know what you would have of us as we go forward as we just commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands, in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.